All right. We're here for the word, right? Praise God. Hallelujah. The title is How to Wait. You know how to wait, don't you? How to wait on the Lord. Did you know we should wait on the Lord sometimes? You're not too sure. I'm telling you, sometimes we need to wait on the Lord. Okay. So what does it really mean then to wait on the Lord? Wait on him for what? Hmm. We want to see the Lord answer prayers usually right now, correct? Well, some of you understand that. We want God to provide our finances now. That would be good, wouldn't it? To heal from illnesses right now. To mend a broken relationship right now. To fulfill our dreams right now. Sometimes it's a little hard to wait on the Lord. We like instant results, correct? Okay. But Isaiah 40 verse 31 tells us that they that wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. Hmm, that'd be great. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So waiting upon the Lord involves a confident expectation of a positive result. We all want positive results, right? In which we place great hope. Amen. Now, the expectation is based then on knowledge and of trust in God. We must be confident of who God is and exactly what he is capable of doing for us in this covenant we live in today. All right? Those who wait on the Lord do not lose heart in their prayers. This is a confidence we have in approaching God that we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Correct? Yes, he does. 1 John 5, verse 14. Now, waiting on the Lord, the Bible tells me, renews our strength. Okay? So, waiting on the Lord by trusting, seeking, and praying establishes our faith then and brings serenity and stability. We all need that, don't we? Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me. He heard my cry. He lifted me up out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth. Mm, a hymn of praise to our God. Now, how many times have you had to wait on God and it doesn't seem just like anything is really happening in your life? I'm sure we've all experienced that. Now, during those spiritual, let's call them lulls, you know what that means, don't you? Your mind can get a little confused with reasoning and it can end up deceiving you, your own mind. Now, the next thing you know, you're off on a tangent. You come out with an Ishmael. You know what an Ishmael is, don't you, instead of an Isaac. One of the hardest things for Christians to learn is to learn to wait on God. All right? There is always a conflict in our minds between acting and waiting. Now listen, in a crisis where something's there, like life and death, no, God will act with you. We're talking about your dreams, your visions, something you're waiting for or expecting God to do in your life. There is a time you wait, a time to process everything and do it God's way, all right? Now, in dealing with deciding between acting and waiting, we have to deal with another problem. It's called presumption. Now, in the book of Numbers, God has told the Israelites to go into the promised land, okay? The Israel, all right? But they listened to the evil report of 10 of the spies, and they refused to go. Then when the plague consumed those 10 spies with the evil report, the people decided that now they would change their minds, and they would go up. But it was too late. 
God had forbidden them to go. Now, when God had commanded them not to go up, they had refused, all right? Now, when they were told that they couldn't go, they decided they would and do their own thing, and they would go up, okay? If you know the story, that's exactly what took place, all right? Now, that really is an example of a carnal mind that's enmity against God, Now, I'm going to read to you from Numbers 14, verse 40 to 44. It says this, They rose up in the morning and went to the top of the mountain, saying, Here we are, and we will go to the place which the Lord had promised, for we have sinned. And Moses said, Now, why do you transgress the command of the Lord? For this will not succeed. Do not go up, lest you be defeated by your enemies, for the Lord is not among you. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and you shall fall by the sword, because you have turned away from the Lord. So the Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up to the mountaintop, didn't they? Nevertheless, neither the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord nor Moses departed from the camp. Now, when we read verse 45 there, you will see that the Israelites then got defeated. It says, then the Amalekites and the Canaanites, who dwelt in the mountain, came down, attacked them, and drove them back as far as Homa. Now, what did they presume to do? They presumed to go without God. Can you see that? God had said no. They said yes. See, presumption is entirely different to faith. Okay? Have you ever been a place... I'm sure you have in different times, where you're not really sure what to do, but you feel tremendous pressure to do something. Listen, you should wait, but you don't. There's great pressure on the soul when we don't know what to do. Now, if you yield to that pressure and act, is that your faith? No. That's presumption. We think we have the right to move independently of God. That is a mistake that Eve made. Now, you see, we're a mistake. God is all. We do not have the right to move independently of God, even if it seems to be good. Now, the Holy Spirit is not going to be sitting back saying, well, I hope he makes it, or she, We must learn to seek God and to wait, all right? Now, when we wait, we bring ourselves to a position of respecting God, and that is important too. God, the creator of time, is not limited by time. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. So the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness, okay? Instead, he's patient with you. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 to 9. Now, God's concept of time then is nothing like ours, and yet his time is perfect. All right? Now, if you're not sure what to do, you'd better not do anything. Don't make a move until you know what you really believe God wants you to do. Do not act, then call it faith, That's presumption, okay? Having to wait causes us to learn to trust him, and that's really important. That is to trust his timing. It's not that God's not willing for you to do something and challenge you with something, but there is a perfect timing in God, all right? Now, if he's given you no further light or revelation or direction, just don't move. You've got to have a good feeling in your spirit that, you know, it's the right time, all right? Now, I know men and women who have come into a church knowing that God had a plan and a purpose for their life. Just for them. Because God's got a purpose for every one of you in different ways. Yet, they never made it to the purpose he intended sometimes. Now, why? That's a good question. Why didn't they make it? Because they acted prematurely. They do. People do. 
Now, some people cannot and will not wait on God's plan to develop. Jesus taught the disciples for three years. The Son of God himself. Three years before they were let loose. All right? I really believe God's going to do something. But I'm not going to jump out there till I know it's the right timing. Amen? See, they had to move now. That was in the soulish realm. All right? Now, you can't do that, or you shouldn't do that. You must wait. You've got to know when God tells you to move. All right? Now, that for people is one of the hardest things for people to do. Wait on God. Sometimes we think that God has forsaken us or forgotten us because we don't seem to be going anywhere or doing anything at times. Now, I believe that most people go through that until they discover how to get into the flow of God. So, we're trying to teach you that tonight. Now, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 to 13, say this. Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you, and now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with a deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. So that's telling us that God is the one working in us. Amen? Romans 4.21 says, You need to be fully persuaded that which God has promised, he will perform. Amen? Now, God wants to teach us how to be patient and wait on him. All right? You must learn to wait because God is at work within you just as he is at work within me. Right? The person who does not learn to wait on God uh, in expectation will always resist divine timing because of the desire to exercise his own will. He probably thinks he's doing the right thing, all right? No one deliberately, if you've got a brain, deliberately goes against what God is saying in his word, right? So it's the spirit of a man that should initiate things in a man's life and not the soul. Now I know a lot of Christians, especially baby Christians, when they're learning about the things of the spirit and they've never been involved, you know, in the Holy Spirit things, as we should, well, they'll want to rush and do things. They get excited when they see God wants to use them. But they've got to be careful of God's timing. There's a training period for every one of us, and it never ends, okay? Now, the soul of a Christian will often work independently of God. You'll be more led by the soul than the spirit. Amen? People get these feelings at time coming from their mind, now, your mind can think of all kinds of things. And the best way to describe that is, do you get some weird dreams? Now, if you get weird dreams, start praying and asking God to give you real dreams. Because I've heard people do crazy things because of their dreams. You need to know what the Spirit of God is saying into your spirit. Too many of your dreams are too much. Okay? Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Take heart. Wait for the Lord. Psalm 27, 14. Okay. He rewards those who wait. And his timing is always perfect. Did you know that? God's timing is always perfect. Now in the Bible, Habakkuk was a minor prophet under the Old Testament. And the main message of the book is how to develop the absolute trust in God. Now, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1 to 3 says, I will, this is in my thinking, stand upon my post of observation and station myself on the tower or fortress and will watch to see what he will say within me. Within you refers to your spirit man, not the soul. He's saying, and what answer I will make as his mouthpiece to the perplexities of my complaint against him. And the Lord answered me and he said, Write the vision, engrave it so plainly upon tablets 
that everyone who passes may be able to read it easily and quickly, right? As he hastens by. Praise God. God told Habakkuk to write out his message very clearly, all right? Explicitly. He wanted the vision to be recorded plainly and accurately so that others would work with him to carry out God's plan. For the vision is yet an appointed time and it hastens to the end. That means fulfillment, all right? It will not deceive or disappoint, though it tarry, wait earnestly for it. That's what that means, wait earnestly for it. Because it will surely come. It will not be behind. And on its appointed day. The prophet is simply saying here, I'm going to set myself on the post of observation. That is hearing from God through waiting on God. God has got a time and a season for everything. Amen? Now, in the wilderness, the Israelites knew when it was time to move. Now, in Exodus chapter 40, verse 34 to 38, it says, When the cloud moved, the Israelites moved with it. When the cloud stopped, they stopped and pitched their tents. Now, there are times in a person's life when he needs to remain where he is or he's pitched his tent, if you like. All right? Now, the Lord led the Israelites by a pillar of fire by night and the cloud of glory of God by day. When that cloud rested, they rested. They pitched their tents and they drove their stakes down, didn't they? Now, sometimes it was less than 24 hours and sometimes it was weeks before the cloud moved again. I mean, they were there for 40 years, weren't they? Now, God says three things in the first verse of Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1, in the Amplified Version. It's a good translation that we looked at before. Number one, I will stand upon my post of observation. That means I will wait. Number two, to see what he will say within me. I'm going to listen to God. Okay? Number three, what answers will I make? Well, I'm going to speak to God, all right? See, it was not until after he heard from God that Habakkuk spoke. When you begin to wait on God, it's a soulish man that says, how could I get out of this thing somehow? If I, you know, hang about and wait, things might get worse. When he's tempting you, well, look, I have to do something. That's, that's basically what we're thinking when we want to move ahead without God's permission, all right? Now, who is really tempting you to do something, do you think? The temptations come from the devil, don't they? God doesn't tempt you. You see, we need to know. Has God spoken? If he has not, you better not do anything, all right? You had better stay on the post of observation, keep your outlook and your vision going with God. All right? Keep watching and see to it that you wait and you listen until God does speak. If you're not doing that, you're operating in presumption. Until you have clearly heard and discerned God's word, learn to wait. For God says in Proverbs 4.20, My son, attend to my words. Incline your ear unto my sayings. That means you need to get into the word of God and back up what you think God is telling you. Okay? Now the word incline means to lean towards and do nothing until you hear from God. Now in a time of pressure, have you had pressure in your life sometimes? Okay. Well, most people would head right into an Ishmael situation. Okay? That's when you find yourself 
with an Ishmael, you have to sit down and look for solutions to work yourself out of it. Have you noticed sometimes you hear testimony and stories of people, they do something impulsive and they make the situation worse. Then you've got to work out, how do I get out of this mess? Now, one clear definition of waiting, however, is to remain expecting something or a result. Okay? That doesn't mean being resigned to the situation or giving up and saying, well, if there is a dream or a desire that God has placed in your heart, that's your spirit, of course, that seems to be taking longer than you thought to come to pass, be encouraged. Because God has a time and a season for everything. God's perfect. Amen? Amen? We often get discouraged simply because his timing is not our timing. Now, part of the process of fulfilling your destiny is learning to trust completely in him. While you're waiting in the waiting season, you know, keep the right attitude. Keep believing. Keep praising and thanking him. Your due season may be a lot closer than you think. Now, if you could just be still on the inside, you would hear the Holy Spirit minister to you with these words. I have not put you on a shelf to collect the dust. He has never put you aside and said, oh, what was your name? Hmm. What was it I promised you to do in your life? Now, let me see uh, if I can remember that. Listen and get this straight. God is ever mindful of you. He knows you. He knows you better than you know yourself. 100% better. All right? He knows exactly where you're at right now. Hebrews 11.1 tells us, So faith then is the substance, the title deed of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. Faith is all the proof you should ever need. When God said it, you believe it, then that is it. That is where your faith really is. All right? Now, there are five ways in which God tells us to wait. Do you want to know? Good. These are good. That's good. They're important. Number one, he wants you to wait earnestly. Number two, this one's a bit difficult at times. Wait patiently. Three, wait quietly. Four, wait continually. And five, wait only. Now, if you have done what Abacuc said, and you have heard God speak, and it seems slow in coming, right? How do you patiently wait for the fulfillment of it? Now, Abaca knew what to do when things were delayed or even seemed hopeless. His world was literally falling apart around him. There was destruction everywhere he looked. But Habakkuk had a revelation that God was bigger than his circumstances. So what did he do? Invited God into his circumstances by rejoicing and praising the Lord. Now, most people in a circumstance that's not very nice, they complain. They're not usually praised. Well, I don't know why God's taking so long. I don't know what the problem is. I asked him. I haven't received yet. Things are getting worse. The deck collectors are becoming real next. Hmm. Now, listen to me. The key to anything you want, whether it's a physical thing, healing, something in your job, if the security is not quite there, prosperity, your family are not spiritually turning the way you think they should go, whatever it is, there are many problems we come up with. Listen to me. The key to everything. Let's say your, your body is full of cancer, which really is a death penalty for most people, right? And you get, and you get in the community, a church, and they start to tell you, look, God's a healing God. He wants to heal your body. It's by his stripes you're healed. Now, how, how do you handle that? Now, this is how you handle it. Once you read it, once you're convinced that God wants to heal you, see, the Bible tells you he wants to heal everybody that's sick. And that's the truth. 
Jesus did when he was here on the earth. So what's changed? Religion's changed. But once you know the truth, that truth can set you free. Now, you ask him, you're sincere, you can get somebody to agree with you, somebody will pray for you, lay hands upon you, but the key now is you believe, you keep your mouth closed if necessary, you don't say negative words, I've heard Christians go, oh, how are you feeling today? Oh, well, I'm not too good today, I, was, well, I woke up feeling pain every day. Stop it! Because negative words stop everything God is wanting to do that you're asking him to do. What you should do, if you're filled with the Spirit, and you've got the Spirit, is you give thanks to God continually. Wake up in the morning, thank you, Jesus, by your stripes I'm healed. Last minute at night, thank you, Jesus, by your stripes I'm healed. And if you really believe it, Shandaramakura, oh, Lord God, I am healed, I am whole. Oh, Rabakarasaratu, hallelujah. Get carried away with it, get loud with it, because that's when you mean it. Amen? Now, I'm not saying you have to do that in front of people, but surely you can do it in the shower, somewhere in the closet, in your house, or where you live. Because when you pray like that, it means you believe it. And the anointing of God will rise up. See, when you pray in the Spirit, you're filling your spirit. You're enlightening your spirit towards God. Do you understand? Oh, I wouldn't do that. That's crazy stuff. Yeah, I know. That's why you don't get anywhere. It is not stupid. It's only stupid to a mind that doesn't know God. God didn't give you anything stupid. And the early church, every time the disciples or anybody that was in the know saw somebody and they were converted, they said, have you received? Have you received? Receive what? The Spirit of God. Why did Jesus tell them to wait? To Pentecost. What was the sign of Pentecost? They all spoke in tongues. As like fire came upon them. And not only did they speak in tongues, they were speaking languages people could hear. Sixteen different dialects were drawn, 3,000 people, to where they were at Pentecost. And they heard their own language being spoken. Now, I'm not trying to be smart, but I'm trying to tell you we need to get smart and just do what God says. If it's not in the Bible, well, forget it. If something's in the Bible, you don't forget it. It's in the Bible so we can learn from it. I better be careful or else I'll go down a different track here. Mm. Hallelujah. All right. So he invited God into his circumstances by rejoicing and praising the Lord. He made the choice to be joyful knowing that his heart attitude would connect him to the one who would deliver him. This is Habakkuk 3, 17 to 19. Even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vine, even though the olive crops fail and the fields lie empty and barren, even the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer able to tread upon the heights. Amen. That's what God wants. So you, your praise is the bridge, if you like, that will carry you into the land of promise. God's promises. Praise God. You know this new covenant we have is better than the old one. It's built on better promises. Now the Bible tells us there's a fullness of joy in his presence. Do you believe that? God's joy is supernatural. It gives us strength. It empowers us to walk through any difficulty we may be facing. And we do face difficulties. Amen? No matter how things may seem in the natural, you can always rejoice knowing that God is working behind the scenes on your behalf. That's the key. Now, Psalm 106, verse 12 to 13 says, They believed his words, they sang his praises. They soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel. What did they not wait for? They did not wait for his counsel and instructions. The Amplified Translation puts it this way, these verses. Then Israel believed his words, trusting in, relying on them, they sang his praise. And they hastily forgot his works. 
They did not earnestly wait for his plans to develop respecting them. Now the word earnest means serious in purpose or effort, sincere, diligent, and determined. Amen. Are you determined to see that whatever God is planning and purposing for you is going to come to pass? Amen. Mm. Then you can be fully persuaded that what God has promised, he is able also to perform. Philippians 1.6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. It's good to know. I respect God. I trust him. I do rely on him to earnestly wait and watch his plans develop on my behalf, whatever he wants me to do. Now, every dream that's in your spirit, your heart, every promise that has taken root, that God has put there, he has every intention of bringing it to pass. Hmm. Now, just because sometimes it seems to take a long time, or because you've tried and felt failure, doesn't mean you give up on those dreams. Stand strong, because your time is coming. How does God develop his plans? He reveals first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn. That's what Mark 4.28 says. You must wait until the full corn comes. Proverbs 16.1 says, The preparation of the heart, that's your spirit, belongs to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. That's interesting. We can make our own plans, but the Lord gives the right answer. If you speak before you hear, you're speaking presumptuously. We've got to all learn to wait on the Lord. Do not panic. Hang tight. Keep trusting God. Keep believing. Don't murmur. Don't complain. And do not talk about the problem. Do not magnify the problem. That's what people do. Exalt the solution. Amen? That's the key. By his stripes, we're healed. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's end of story, if you really believe. Do you know where that will lead you? This is Psalm 106. I'm going to read verse 13 and verse 15 from the Amplified, okay? They hastily forgot his works. They did not earnestly wait for his plans to develop respecting them, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted and tried to restrain God with their insistent desires in the desert. And he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. Now, think about this. If God granted everything we wanted, when we wanted, we wouldn't need faith. Do you understand that? I'll say it again so it gets into your spirit. If God granted everything we wanted, when we wanted, we wouldn't need faith. No, you're not smiling now. We'd also be calling the shots if we had it that way, wouldn't we? Also, not everything that we ask for is what God desires for us. Right? The children of Israel couldn't wait to hear from God. They were impatient. They nagged him. And eventually, he gave them what they asked for. But it didn't do them any good spiritually. And the Bible calls it leanness in their souls, their thinking, their mind. All right? Every time you get into that realm, you've stopped waiting for God's plans. You're trying to do your own thing. And God's not in it. And it will cause leanness in your soul as well. That's interesting. If you have earnestly waited on God... Are you trusting God? Were you on your post of observation like we read earlier? If you get down on a fleshly level into the soulish realm, you're not going to be on the tower to see what God is doing. This speaks to our souls 
and brings them into perspective. This is how the Holy Spirit chastises and corrects his sons and daughters. You probably do not want to hear it because you're tired of waiting. I've heard people, oh, I gave up. Yeah, I was waiting for a while. I waited, you know, I waited seven weeks. Nothing happened. You know, you're just getting ready. See, it, it means you don't like to admit it to yourself, but you've become tired of trusting God. Well, I've been doing this for far too long. You don't understand. God is not going to speak to your carnal ears. Did you know that? And he doesn't. He opens the spirit man which is the candle of the Lord, your spirit. Psalm 119 verse 105 says this, Your word is a lamp unto my feet. It's a light to my path. The word of God is. That's what we follow. We should be obedient to the word. Then he says in Psalm 119 verse 130, The entrance of your words gives light. You get revelation from it. And most people don't bother to read the Word. They go to church and hear two verses of Scripture. I've got 55 for you tonight. <laughs> you say, oh no. See? Hmm. The Word is light, the Spirit being the candle. God lights the candle, illumination goes on, and then you will understand the purpose and the direction of God. It means you will move with surety if you earnestly wait for God's plan to be developed. Wait patiently. That's hard to do, isn't it? Hmm. In Psalm 73, the psalmist was discouraged because it seemed the wicked prospered more than he was able to. It says in Psalm 73, a few verses here, for I envied the proud when I saw them prosper, despite their wickedness. Well, we can see that today in commercialism. There's greed everywhere. I've had people crying to me in the last few days, different ones. Why? They can't afford rent. Some people are now living in their cars. Greed has taken the rent sky high. One lady was crying her heart out to me today. Twice she rang me. Paying $500 just for a room. Then he comes in and tells her she's got to pay for the electricity too. Neighbor told her, well, I don't do that. It's greed. Amen. They scoff and speak only evil in their pride to seek to crush others. Look at these wicked people enjoying life of ease while their riches multiply. Did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? Then Psalm 73 continues, Then I went into your sanctuary, O God, and finally understood the destiny of the wicked. In an instant, they will be destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. Then I realized that my heart was bitter, and I was all torn up on the inside. I was foolish, ignorant, Yet I still belong to you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, leading me to a glorious destiny. Oh, well, you're going to a glorious destiny if you're a believer. You won't have to pay any more rents. Now, don't fret because of those who look as if they're getting everything right now. Psalm 37, verse 3 to 7 says, Trust in the Lord, do good, dwell in the land, feed on his faithfulness, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. They're the things God, through his word, has put into your spirit. Amen? Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him. He shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as a light and your justice as a noonday. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. The Bible says that if we pray in faith according to God's word, then God will hear us, he will answer those prayers. Hey, you need to understand, if you will pray in faith, 
that's in line with God's word, he will bring it to pass. So don't quit. Don't give up. You should be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath in all things. That's God's desire. When you do have a plan from God in your heart, you don't have to struggle and try to force it to happen. It will happen if it's God's plan. You don't have to be worried or be frustrated, wondering if it's ever going to come to pass. When you have the promises of God deep down in your spirit, the Bible says you will enter into the rest of God. That's a place of total trust. A place where you know beyond a shadow of doubt that God is going to see you through. Now we must remember that even when we don't see him, he's working. He's in control. And even when we don't feel him, he's still working. Praise is blessing him for what he has done even when you can't see it. When we wait on the Lord, we can expect added and renewed strength. Isaiah 40, verse 31, let me say this again. But they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with things like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God wants us to see our circumstances from his perspective, how God sees it, all right? The eagle's strength lies in its wings, doesn't it? They're very powerful. And when we wait on him, we will soar above our circumstances. That's what the word will do for us. And we will faithfully wait upon him. That means we can rest in him and his word. Amen? That's why the word is so vital for you. Just pick some of the epistles out to read to get the instructions. The Gospels is the way unto salvation. But that leads into the Acts and the Epistles, which are wonderful information that we live by.